So today we're talking with Rip Parts from Design Strategies about target value design. To begin with, I'm going to have Rip tell you a little bit about himself, design strategies, and his experience with integrated project delivery. Thank you, Sally. I am the managing principal of Design Strategies, which is a full-service architecture and engineering firm. And what made this project appropriate and, and ideal in many ways is that the client actually asks for it. They sought this as a delivery method. They did not want, because of past experiences, your typical design bid build uh, delivery product. In, in which project was this? Oh, I'm sorry. This is the Cherokee Indian Hospital for the Cherokee Indian Nation. Great. Um, so I let to begin, um, what are some advantages to designers of IPD? What, what was clear and the reason why the client insisted on this is in IPD, it totally aligns the interests of the client with the motives of the architect and the contractor. In uh, typical design bid build delivery, or any other delivery as a matter of fact, the, I was surprised to learn how the architect and the contractor have to devote so much energy into defensive practice, meaning they're always concerned about being challenged, uh, and in the worst case, you're always concerned about, and way back, you were concerned about litigation if something goes wrong. In IPD, you agree as a team, and that team includes the owner, Okay, the owner, the contractor, and the architect and the designer agree not to sue each other. And then, and that just takes a huge amount off. And then the, so then the question is, well, what is next? I mean, the point is to be focused on what is in the interest of the owner. So the owner articulates what their goals are. And, and, and what I think is so exciting about it, is, first of all, is the venue. A lot of it involves co-location. So we had a co-location trailer which means full-time architect, full-time contractor, full-time owner. The owner has participated in this as well, as well as the architect. And so it becomes this rolling, ongoing, dynamic process of testing all the assumptions and moving forward together as a team and not worrying about who made a mistake, but how, if there are mistakes, when there are mistakes, you correct them live, mm -hmm. on the spot. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, so do you mind just giving us a brief overview of what target value design is. Right. You know, there's a management principle that says start with the end in mind, which is usually what I do when I rationalize buying dessert before an entree. Is start with the end in mind. Well, you know what? The start, the end in mind is the quality level of the, of the project. In this case, it was a hospital. So in target value design, well, let me contrast it the way it's normally done. Normally what happens is the architect invests and the engineer invests so much in the design with the best understanding they have programmatically of the, of the quality and the function of the building and invest all this time and effort and energy and then it goes to the market and then the contractor comes back and says it's too expensive, we can't afford it. And then you get into the so-called value engineering which in itself is a misnomer. So in value engineering is a very painful and inefficient process because what it does is it tries to dismember what had been integrated as a design and ultimately what happens in value engineering is that the systems get pulled apart and it's easy to make the suggestion but there are unintended downstream consequences to redesigning a system on the fly. Oh let's save some money here. You don't have time. You cannot forecast the downstream impact. In target value design in front of everybody in that co-location trailer is a list of all the quality assumptions. And that includes mechanical systems, electrical systems, finishes. Uh, a major part of it is the building skin, including uh, glazing, curtain wall, the extent of curtain wall, even down to things like the extent of landscaping, whatever. So all of those systems, which follow really the specification format, all those systems are agreed to initially. And they're right in front of you. And a budget's are established pretty much like a conventional project. There are budgets for it. But the difference is the value, the, the, the agreement is up front. And as the project develops and rolls along, and the owner makes changes, of course, because it's a dynamic process, mm -hmm. there is there's a constant live testing of the assumptions. It is not this time-consuming, well, we draw it, design it, draw it, issue it, wait for the contractor to tell you it doesn't work, come back, all the rework and all the correspondence and emails and conference calls, that is cut completely out pretty much because it's done right there in the colo trailer. Mm -hmm. They say, eh, this isn't going to work. And, and honestly, 
with a really quality contractor, which is always important, um, their input is valuable. Because they are, the architect rarely, no one thinks about this, the architect rarely has the privilege of having a contractor, in a sense, on staff. Mm -hmm. So just like we have engineers that are so important, because we turn to our engineers and say, what about this, what about that? And they'll say, this works, that doesn't work, don't do that. And so, um, but with the, with the, we don't have contractors on staff. But now, with that target value design, or IPD, you know, IPD, they're there, they're part of the team, they are part of the staff. Mm -hmm. And so we float ideas, and they are really good about saying, don't do that because it's just so much more time consuming, do this. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the huge advantage. That's great. Um, well, that well that covers what are the positives. Oh, sure um, does. What are the constraints or the difficulties? The, the biggest difficult. constraint is the scale of the project. It, it, financially or cost-wise, there's overhead associated with this. Mm -hmm. So. The, don't kid yourself. There is there is overhead associated with colo trailers and all these big contractors. Uh, I would say a project, and this is just an estimate, a project anything below seventy five million, I don't think would be a good candidate. Uh, bigger projects definitely work, and the and, and actually the ones that are the most complex. So if you have an urban setting with a lot of constraints and a, an expensive project, that's ideal. If it's in a cornfield and ten million dollars, no way. It, it just doesn't pay for itself. Mm -hmm. um, how, did, how does target value design affect design management? And I, by management, I'm assuming the design process mm -hmm. and how we do that. Uh, again, it becomes live feedback, which is rare. It kind of gets, you have to get used to that. Mm -hmm. You're not used to it. Now, mm -hmm. there is a time and place for the designer to reclude to, to be a recluse and, and separate themselves from that to think it through. I mean, you can't, you know, you have to, it, it's a process, as we all know, and it's an iterative process. It's not a straight line. Contractors think it's a straight line process, but it's not. It's iterative. It's back and forth. And, and actually, this is an education for them. Frankly, I mean, our contractors are going like, wow, I didn't realize how hard this was. And yeah. <laughs> of course, they we could say the same thing about construction. But so what we do is the the, the big idea is clearly developed from the design team, but quickly it gets down into a, a, a refined, a, a iterative process that includes the contractor, and I think that's the difference. The only constraint, I would say, is what I just mentioned. They're culturally, the contractors tend to think of design like a manufactured automobile, that you're just reproducing something you've always done. And as we know, every design really is unique. There's nothing like it. There's never been one like what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And so it is not designing a car that's reproduced. It is a one of a kind, and they're just not used to that mindset. So it's, it's valuable for both teams. Mm -hmm. um, so how do you think that that affects the, um, the, the project management from a construction point of view? Ooh, uh, good question. Um, the contractor that we used had been involved in an IPD project before. It just rolled off of one. In fact, that's why they were selected mm -hmm. as a result. Mm -hmm. So um, I would say that what the difference for me walking into it, first of all, is the ambience of a co-location trailer. Mm -hmm. I mean, and the fact that this, the budgeting, the target value design, the tar when I was in the background, actually the charts you look at in the co-location trailer are not about target value design because that's just agreed to beforehand. What you're looking at is the progress of the project and the adjustments that are made on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. So it's like every day there is a checkpoint. You get around the table and they, and there are, you know, there's daily, there's weekly. The bigger issues are done weekly. It's not literally daily, but on a regular basis, not monthly. On a regular basis, you are meeting eyeball to eyeball with the very people who are making this happen. Mm -hmm. And so you your focus is all about team and what is the goal. And of course, the owner is there too. They And again, interestingly, that's not something they're used to. Mm -hmm. A lot of times they have to resource that because they're used to building, in our case, they're running hospitals and they're used to doing that. They're not used to siphoning off of their staff to do something like this. So they have to identify key people that are willing to put in the time, just like architects, putting in their time. Mm -hmm. It's clear the contractor is the central person building it, so you'd expect their team to be fully staffed. Mm -hmm. But it's a, it, is a, it is a key decision on the design firm's part. Are they going to allocate, how are they going to allocate enough staff to do this as an exclusive effort, and most of which is on site, not next to the mm -hmm. office? Mm -hmm. So how many people did y'all have on site? Well, see, we couldn't afford to have people there 
24-7 like the contractor, mm -hmm. so we were there a lot. And so we would say, depends on the, the, the time frame, but it probably had about six or eight. Okay. I got six or eight people mm -hmm. at any given time. Mm -hmm. And of course, again, it depends on what phase. Mm -hmm. so, so how does target value design affect estimate and schedule? Well, it is everything. I mean, the, the target value design, again, is what is agreed to at the very beginning. What I would say is that we don't waste a lot of time downstream redesigning. Mm -hmm. And so, therefore, redesign means the contractor has to reprice mm -hmm. and has to go back to the market mm -hmm. over and over again. And that has to be draining as well. And that, frankly, is the norm. I mean, mm -hmm. let's say anything. I, what, I, I can't emphasize enough that in the best of circumstances, and there's always human elements to this that complicate it, but in the best of circumstances, the tension level is so much lower because the energy is in towards is towards problem solving, not towards blaming. Mm -hmm. And you don't realize, you really don't realize how much energy and time and effort goes into email trails and covering yourself both for the contractor and the owner, and the owner's side, by the way, because they're always, you know, everybody's covering for everybody um, in a conventional process, even though everyone's well-intended. Mm -hmm. um, there, there's an enormous amount of wasted and it's mm -hmm. the waste, I guess, is what I'm trying to say, that is avoided in, in um, target value design and in IPD. Mm -hmm. um, how are changes handled in IPD? Uh, live, live and ongoing. I'm not saying that there's not any friction in that process, <laughs> as you can imagine. There's always because there's a human element to this, and the, and the owner, the architects want quality, and the contractor usually is price sensitive and delivery sensitive, and the owner's stuck in between trying to figure it all out, and they have to make that decision. So, um, I, the, well, now the question again was which. The How are changes handled? Change, okay. Because, you know, in that the typical is the sense, it's really hard. You know, changes incur a lot of cost and they do. Now, time. They're, they're, they add to the estimate, I mean, to the schedule. Oh, absolutely. Now, there is a documentation or memorialization of the changes mm -hmm. so that you're not, it's not totally renegade <laughs> process. I mean, you, you've got to make sure that you show changes along the way. But it is so completely different and refreshing mm -hmm. because, um, as we encounter, as the contractor encounters a situation, is usually how mm -hmm. I'm... Well, first of all, let's back up. The contractor is involved in the design process. He's not just relegated to the construction side of it. That's the first point. Mm -hmm. So in the design process, we have to report our design to the contractor. Mm -hmm. Now, that's different. <laughs> and so they get to opine about, let's say, okay, let's talk about curtain wall, mm -hmm. extent of curtain wall. Mm -hmm. And in this particular project, we had a, a fairly extensive amount of glass because we spread the building out like fingers on a hand mm -hmm. because we were trying to introduce natural light into the building, which is in the owner's interest as a healthcare facility. Okay, but that competes against cost effectiveness. The most cost effective building is is an ugly box, and so that's that's. That could easily be the default is what's well, an ugly box. So that's the most cost effective. Well, we're not here to design ugly boxes. And the owner doesn't want ugly boxes. And so that was one of the issues on this particular project is we had to kind of fight for the the uh, maximizing the amount of natural light in the curtain wall. All right. So then the question is, and this is not uncommon, um, it, all right, what are you going to give up? Right? If you if you want that, what are you going to give up, the contractor says. Mm -hmm. The difference is that a conversation occurs in the design process, mm -hmm. not when it's in the field. Because if you have that same discussion after the construction starts, and this is important, the contractors only give back a little bit of what the value was. And there's maybe good reasons for that, but of course architects are famous for saying to the owner, you only get 10 cents on the dollar. Mm -hmm. It may you may have had this value as a hundred dollars, but if you change it, you're only going to get ten bucks out of the hundred dollars, and that's probably because there's so much overhead and effort that goes into making all the changes mm -hmm. on the contractor's part. Mm -hmm. So that I think is very important that that in the design process you hammer out basically the big issues, mm -hmm. and they're always going to be small ones that surface always mm -hmm. uh, when any kind of design uh, construction. Well, it sounds like you really enjoyed working on the IPD oh, project. It was great. And, and not only was it great and refreshing and stimulating in so many ways, but what happens if you have a successful IPD project, and I, I would call this one a very successful project, 
the contractors come out of it, and interestingly, the subs. And we're not, you know, you'd think of the contractors, but that's not one entity. Let's face it, most of them are construction managers that, that really hold the contract for all the subs. The subs who have never been through this before, almost a very few of them have ever been through this process, they came out of it going like, whoa, this is transformative. Now understand, what's very different about this is that everybody has to reveal all of their costs. Mm -hmm. There are no secrets, including salaries. Mm -hmm. Whoa. <laughs> Whoa. And so the whole industry is all built around concealing. You think of it. it mm -hmm. The industry, all of us, are concealing. Right? And it is like reporting to a meeting in your underwear. Mm -hmm. Because everybody has to say, this is exactly, on those meetings about weekly or monthly, when we talk about where do we stand, Everybody has to say, this is what it really costs me to do this. Mm -hmm. All my profit is here and everything. And But the, the good news is the profit was at risk. <clears throat> and so and you say, well, is that good? Well, yeah, because it's not a concealed profit. It is a stated profit. And so we are all in it together to ensure that that subcontractor is successful. Because if he is not successful, my profit is at risk. You see, it's not just one person's profit. We are in this together. So in terms of the IPD, it may not be just target value design I'm talking about here, but in terms of IPD broadly, it is total transparency. And man, you don't think that is not a change. But it's also very stimulating because once you get past the honesty part, the transparency, which is probably good in any relationship, Sally, whether it's a marriage relationship or business relationship, once you get into transparency, then you can solve the problem. Mm -hmm. But if while people are concealing issues in life and in business, then you're never going to get past mm -hmm. the, de the defenses. So I have one more question because this has come up in the past couple of weeks um, with some of the discussions with the students. Um, so it's very clear how the architect and the contractor, how this is different for them and maybe even for the subs. How is it different for the guys and the, and the women, like the laborers that are yeah. out there building it? Like, well, what is their benefit, do you think, from IPD, or how does this affect them? Ooh, that's a good question. Yeah, um, I thought it was a really great question. Um, that came up. The only thing I would think that most of the workers, if that's what you're talking mm -hmm. about, they're working for the subs, and the subs are the ones that are experiencing it as something very different. I guess the only thing I could say, on one hand, it's not different because at the end of the day, it's building the building, right? Mm -hmm. On the other hand, the fact that the subs came back and said, this is transformative, I have to believe that in their little inner circles that they were very excited about it, and I'll tell you why. It was almost, if I can use the term, it was almost missional in the sense that, and they were very clear about this, our mission was to serve, in this case, the Cherokee. Of course, mm -hmm. they're, so, they're such a fabulous client that there was a, a heart connection to the mm -hmm. Cherokee. Okay, so that helped. But in anything, people love a team sport, right? Mm -hmm. and, and the team sport, in this case, was to make this project a success together. And when you're not worried about pointing fingers, the energy goes to everybody succeeding. So I would say that the, the actual worker in the field got kind of caught up in the energy of this thing because they go, wow, this is really cool. I'm not having to protect myself. The only, they're never asking me about who was, was wrong. They never asked me to defend myself. They only said, get it done and let's do it well and share every information with the architect. And they're like, what? Yeah, share it. Mm -hmm. Don't waste time covering it propel the information forward, move it up, don't move it down. Mm -hmm. So I would think that now that you're asking the good question, I would think they probably, I hadn't asked them, but I bet they were very um, energized by this process. Mm -hmm. Well, great. Thank you very much. Um, I appreciate you spending your time with me. My pleasure.